Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing literacy as a powerful tool for helping our children to do to prosper with special guests, Adiola Whitney, CEO of Reading Partners in Oakland, Joel Zaro, CEO of Children's Literacy Initiative in Philadelphia, and Heather Jenkins, CEO of the Literacy Lab in Washington, D.C. So thank you so much for joining us. This is just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to uh, to talk through some really important issues. And uh, I, I just wanted to set this up uh, with the fact that in the last decade, schools have increased their focus on reading and writing in order to close learning gaps and to teach literacy as a foundation for uh, learning other subjects. So let's discuss the idea of being hyper-focused on literacy and why this is so important to a child's development. And let's start with you all in Oakland. Could you talk a little bit about your programs at Reading Partners and how you create the foundation for a prosperous future for our children going forward? Uh, Mark, you said it beautifully, and I, I'm going to restate it because it was so important. I mean, you said reading is the foundation for all future learning, and that is true. The ability to read transforms lives and empowers children and communities to thrive. And the work that Joel and Heather and I and folks in our organizations are, are doing, we, we know and we talk about this all the time. I'm not together, but I'm sure within our organizations that, you know, kindergarten through third grade is such a critical time for children to learn foundational skills before they move to more advanced skills. Yet only 35% of fourth graders in the U United States are reading at a proficient level, meaning that third and fourth graders often mark as a critical fork um, in the road academically. Um, children who are not reading proficiently by the end of third grade are four times less likely to graduate from high school on time than proficient readers. And when students can read on grade level by fourth grade, they become well positioned to graduate from high school, access higher education, and contribute to an increasingly um, information-based world. So what we do at Reading Partners, we're a national nonprofit. Um, we are based in Oakland. However, I'm in uh, the New York, New Jersey area. And we mobilize communities in 12 regions across the country to provide students in under-resourced communities with proven individualized reading support that they need to read, uh, that they'll need to be able to read at grade level by fourth grade. So we recruit and train and support community volunteers uh, to tutor as they work one on one with our students, either in person or online, 45 minutes um, a day, two days out of a week uh, using structured, really easy to follow research based uh, curriculum. You know, a bit about us. you're yeah. making such an important point because it doesn't matter where you are in this country. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what your circumstance is. If you do not have the resources and the access to a good education, you as a child, your, your future is impaired. That's Heather, how do, how do you um, evolve your programs at Literacy Lab um, to address this need uh, in your area? One of the things that we do is really think about who arrives at um, in kindergarten with the skills that they need to be successful in kindergarten. And that really prompted us to say, yes, we have a K through three model for all of the exact reasons that Ola beautifully narrated. But we also have a pre-K model because we work in black and brown communities um, with historically marginalized young people. And we are working against generational education inequities in these communities. So we know that our students are showing up to kindergarten without all of the things that their more privileged peers may have when they show up to kindergarten. And so we're really focused on that, really perfecting our pre-K work as well as our K-3 to work um, to ensure that students are able to really achieve success. And one of the things we have been talking about with the pandemic is 
well, what happens when we see more and more of our kindergartners who didn't have any access to anything over the past you know, year and a half? And so we've been trying to figure out how we do some potential hybrid work to really meet students where they are. We're going to have third graders that are still at a second grade level. We're going to have second graders who are maybe at a kindergarten level, depending upon what they had access to during this pandemic. And so we're really looking at how do we adjust what we do and how we do it to best meet students where they are. And also we're starting to think a lot about because we recognize that these are generational challenges that our communities face, how are we supporting the families of our students in helping with their literacy skills as well? So that's something we're diving into as an organization. One of the things that I find to be really fascinating about the United States is that uh, bilingualism is sometimes treated as if it's not a good thing, right? And, and, and very often, you ha it really reflects more of the um, inadequacy of, of our teaching approaches because bilingualism actually gives uh, young people an incredibly sophisticated uh, view of grammar, of sentence structure. Uh, there are different alternative ways of expressing that, but uh, sometimes the teachers who are not necessarily bilingual see only the the um, a, a disadvantage in this, and then try to discourage something that is ha that is unfolding in the in the home in a in a wonderful way. And just you know, full disclosure, I'm bilingual. I grew up bilingual. I, it's it's German and English, but you know, I I found that that all of my fellow fellows in school who also were growing up in bilingual in different languages. Uh, also benefited from that. Joel, how do you experience that at the Children's Literacy Initiative where this sort of idea of bilingualism, uh, I think is shifting, but I'm not, I, I'm not really as close to it as you are. How do, how do you experience it? And by the way, your, your microphone is on mute. Yeah, thank you, Mark. First, Children's Literacy Initiative is also a nonprofit organization and we are a national nonprofit. We essentially help teachers, we're teacher coaches, we help teachers get better at what they do so we get better outcomes for kids. Um, I think your question about bilingualism goes back to the very founding of the country. I think we still struggle with the concept of the American dream and what does it mean to have access. Um, it, it, if you travel around the world, you realize how limited our understanding of uh, what, what young children, what we're all capable of in terms of uh, language learning. I think we all want children to have access to the dominant language structure that's going to give them access to jobs, employment, all, all of that stuff. But I think um, how we go about it right now in education is really white normative. Um, I think that it, it, it doesn't only apply to bilingualism in um, Spanish, French, the classics. I think it also has to do with are grappling with race and racism. So if you're a black child coming to school and a teacher says that's not proper English and doesn't appreciate the cultural and linguistic assets that that child is coming with to class, that child, I could well imagine, thinks, but that's how we speak at home. So, I, And then that fractures a sense of belonging in that classroom. So how we understand the linguistic assets that kids are bringing with them really shapes the extent to which a child wants to learn from you. And I think we need to understand that. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it's so interesting because in the, in the founding of the country, the, the big controversy was between German, the German language and the, and the English language, right? I mean, this, this country could have ended up being um, a German-speaking uh, country because um, at that point, there was a huge, huge group of people who were German speakers, right? So that was the that was the big issue. It then became uh, in certain areas of the country French, right? Where you know uh, and and Creole and, and and that kind of thing, and then Spanish. And now we're in an international uh, world where everybody's connected to everybody. So this whole idea of of different language and different rhythms of language and different grammars of language. How do we teach uh, literacy? When literacy is so much about structure and, and you know, English vocabulary, those kinds of things, how do we um, incorporate the benefits of literacy that is focused on the dominant language 
while also appreciating the the texture and the benefits of multilingualism and sort of that basis of, of becoming multilingual. So for later on, we can do business in different languages in different countries. Heather, how do, how do you deal with that kind of issue with an organization called the Literacy Lab? That's such a great question and something we're really uh, spending a lot of time thinking about and talking about as an organization. And and, and let me just share Literacy Lab, like um, my fellow organizations here is a national nonprofit. We are currently working um, in, in six states. And like I said, we have kind of a pre-K model and a K through three model. Um, and so one of the things we've been talking about a lot is how well do we know our communities? Um, I think the pandemic really taught us that just being in schools that are located in particular communities doesn't really mean that we know those communities and that we are connected to those communities in the ways that we need to be. Um, And so that's one thing that we've recognized. And another thing that we've recognized is that our model... um, you know, it's made kind of generally, um, which means, you know, to Joel's point, it's made kind of from like a white normative frame of reference. And so how do we continue to look at the assets in our communities, the language, the culture, the history in our communities, and use that to really, you know, build a model that is more culturally responsive to those that we are serving? Because we know that when we make those connections to culture and context, and we bring the learning in through through that lens, just as we were talking about with multilingualism, the learning is going to be enhanced. So when students are able to see themselves reflected in the passage that their literacy lab tutor or leading men fellow um, is working on with them, when they're able to see themselves reflected in that, when they're able to maybe hear parts of their language, hear just names in the passages that reflect kind of who they are and where they're from, they are going to have a greater connection to that learning. So that is something that we are spending a lot of time thinking about as we go into our first strategic planning process is what does our work look like in a culturally responsive context? Can you know, I just, we just add? A, um, we, we just did a, a, uh, a uh, poll. I'll go to you in a second. We asked, is, is literacy a fundamental human right of all Americans that should be supported through use of tax dollars? Mm-hmm. 5 of the people who listened, who are listening right now, said yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm sorry for, for interrupting. Um, uh, go ahead. That, no, please don't apologize. I was just so excited to hear both what Joel and Heather just said. And um, if, if this were call and response, I was on mute like, yes, yes. I could probably <laughs> see my head nodding, um, you know, so, so aggressively. But I, I, I think both of you uh, summed up your point so beautifully and I, I couldn't agree with you more. And just a couple of things that I wanted to underscore. Heather, as you were talking, and you and I have talked about this before too, but I, I think there is this notion of, are you doing work, and especially as, with, as a national nonprofit doing work, right? Whether you are in Joel's organization supporting teachers or you're in Heather or my um, organization supporting the work through the school and using AmeriCorps members. I think the fundamental question we always have to ask is, are we doing this work with the community, to the community or for the community? And ultimately, the answer should be with, right? But it's not always. And I've worked in a number of national nonprofits, as I know Heather has too. Joe, I don't, you know, I don't know for you, but, you know, we're oftentimes we think we have the answer and we want to enlighten you and teach you what we know, as opposed to the answer lies somewhere in the middle. Yes, we have tools, but there are tools and resources and communities. And the more that we understand those communities, the better off we are. And then just to go back to the point around languages spoken, I think it was the National Institute, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Um, They did research and and, and it told, it tells us that students do not quote unquote pick up reading as hearing children pick up spoken language, but rather reading is learned through conscious cultivation of key literacy skills. And that, I mean, and that is what all of our organizations are just so focused on doing children when they're struggling and they they may may not have the key literacy skills. There's oftentimes a skill gap in the interventions that we provide or to help fill what, you know, what those gaps um, and what exist. Well, I wanted to I want to stay with you for a second. This this notion about um, literacy is a fundamental human right. You know, if you take a look at what uh, other countries are doing, India, for example, has a huge 
structure of education. China has a huge structure of education. Europe has a huge structure of education where um, a great education is not something that is uh, that robs people of wealth because it's not expensive. It's it's part of what is publicly supported, and it's it's viewed as by those uh, uh, countries. The, those young people are viewed uh, by those countries as really key to that country's future. You want to try to exploit the capabilities of every young person as they grow up and you have to give them a good foundation. Do you believe that literacy itself ought to be a human right? And is it something that we ought to um, uh, support through um, increased uh, tax expenditures? Absolutely, yes. Capital Y, capital E, capital yes, it is. I mean, I the, the way I talk about literacy is that it you cannot set, you cannot have a conversation about literacy without having a conversation about inequality. And um, you know, when you think about education equity, you 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 can't. Or when you're talking about literacy, you you can't divorce the two. When we think about the communities in which we serve, and you think about under resourced communities, I first think about poverty, and poverty is the lack of privilege and and access to resources. And so, if we know as my colleagues already so beautifully articulated that in many of the communities that we're serving, that our students are starting behind the finish line, then there's work that we need to do, not just to catch them up, but to truly support them, right? To truly support them. And I think to do that, to, to do anything but not look at literacy that way, I think is a disservice to the communities that we are so, that the three of us and our organizations are so hard trying to work for. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would say. I'm curious, Joel and Heather, what yeah. you all would say about that, too. Adiola, I mean, I completely agree with every single thing that you said. And Mark, could we use more tax dollars allocated to uh, early literacy? Absolutely. It would just build the foundation we need as a country. But the single largest line item in any state budget is public education. We are spending more tax dollars to public education than any other sector. But if you dig in more deeply and, and look at how those tax dollars are allocated, you will uncover huge inequity. So we really have to look at the distribution of the current tax dollars across the system. So in most urban, in most cities, um, it's, on, um, it's on sales revenue. In most suburbs, it has to do with, um, with uh, property tax. So in higher uh, valued suburbs, you have more dollars going to the schools than you do in urban centers. And yet we need to allocate for equity's sake more dollars to urban centers than we do necessarily to the suburbs. So we have to look at the distribution of wealth and how not just more money, but what we're doing with the money we have. So is what you're saying is that the way we actually allocate taxes, which goes in, in each of those instances, goes along um, uh, vectors of wealth, right? So if education is funded based on the wealth of the populace that is doing the funding, then and, and that funding flows uh, along those uh, into those communities, wherever the wealth exists or does not exist. Right. What you end up doing is is the powerful remain powerful and the unpowerful are not powerful. Right. So how do we how do we shift that, Heather? Do we we've often heard this whole idea of constantly creating such a such a safety net that people are not self sufficient? Um, how do you see this in terms of uh, childhood literacy? Is this a is this an issue where we really do have to um, extend beyond our own selfish interests and look at the country, or or how do you see it? Yeah, I, I just want to say I completely agree with everything that my colleagues here have said. And if you look at the Literacy Labs website, you will see in bold, <laughs> we believe literacy is a human right. It is on our website. It's 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 why this organization was created by, by our co-founders to try to bring that to fruition for the communities that we serve. And I think 
I could not agree more um, with Joel's comments around redistribution of the funds um, from less from an equality uh, metric to an equity metric to ensure that those folks have what they specifically need to move forward. But I do agree with you. I think that there is a kind of value and narrative shift that must happen because right now I'm sure if I were to call 500 people and say, do you think that all young people deserve, you know, an equitable access to high quality education? Pretty sure all 500 would say yes. But then if I were to call back and say, well, guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna, redistrib we're gonna redistribute, um, you know, the, the tax money to ensure that schools are more equitably funded. People would be looking at their own self-interest, would be thinking about potential loss of privilege and advantage and not want to give that up. When we have power, when we have privilege, when we have advantage historically in this country, we think of it as like a finite pie. And so if so someone else's slice is made larger than my slice is made smaller. We don't think about that it's for the collective and greater good that we have this. But then at the same time, if we're not funding these things and investing in them up front, we're going to pay for it on the other side, right? Because then we say, oh, you know, X percentage of folks in this community or that community do not have the quote unquote employable skills. Well, that's because we didn't invest up front. And we said that we're going to, you know, kind of keep privilege and wealth and power in certain places rather than making some more radical and transformative and revolutionary shifts to how we do what we do. And that's why we just keep kind of going on this same hamster wheel because we haven't changed the narratives around moving away from kind of individual and I need to have my pieces to a more collective, hey, this is what's good for all of us. And so I'm going to invest in this. I guess it, it gets down to what the definition of the social compact is and where, when we sort of inflect from individual liberty to a, a more social compact type of concept. We just finished one of the uh, one of our polls and we said, besides teacher and parents, how much responsibility do we all have to ensure literacy for children who are not ours? Right. So not my child, but your child. And um, about 80 percent said we are all responsible. Um, about uh, a little bit over 20 percent said uh, we are not responsible, but should contribute. And nobody said we are not responsible. So what, what's interesting there is that when it comes to children, I, I, I think that people are more uh, willing to say, you know, we do have a social compact surrounding children Ola, and, and uh, perhaps we should go beyond our own selfish uh, interest. A couple of questions were, were just asked. And I want to ask your opinion on them. The first is uh, comes from uh, Jolene, who always contributes great Great questions. It's really about the responsibility of parents, right? And and parents sometimes, uh, because uh, they live in uh, they can live in very difficult circumstances, um, they have a they have a tough time knowing how to navigate. Um, and and also um, we have to we have to say it. You know, some parents are not particularly focused on literacy for their children. How do you see your your organizations working with parents? and encouraging them, equipping them to become advocates for their children and getting involved in their children's education. I think if there were ever a time for families to get involved or, <laughs> or for families to understand what was happening in the classroom, it was this last year. I mean, parents saw it without having to be at a parent conference or leaving their jobs in the middle of the day because so many of us were home with our, you know, with our kids. And so I, I think we had the best window. I, I will say, you know, in, in reading Partners 21 Year History, we've not always been great at doing this work with our communities. And in fact, I think the initial structure of how we were created, we did the work during the day when most of our families of our students were, were at work. So we, you know, we, we didn't go above and beyond always to engage our families that COVID made that change for us. And so we know that um, the students that we serve, their libraries at home are not nearly as extensive. I don't know the percentages or numbers, but aren't nearly as extensive as those from more affluent homes. And so a big focus of ours is how can we work with families and figure out what are the resources they want to ultimately support their children with their learning at home? And how can we provide that? Not this is what they want. Want. This is what research says we 
must do, but rather let's just ask them. Maybe let's just survey them. Let's ask them what are their greatest needs right now to, in supporting their children through their literacy journey and how can organizations like Reading Partners partner with them? Well, we've done that. And uh, through doing that, we have something called Take Reading Home. And it's an opportunity where children are incentivized to have books, whether in our online program or our in, in-person um program where they're encouraged to take books home. Over the summer, we gave thousands of books um, to so many of our families to ultimately ensure that they have reading that they can do at home. We also provided um, an e-learning not e-learning, but an e-books, an e-library, if you will, that, that's available not just on a computer, but on any digital device. So families have access to books that they can read with their kids. So those are some of the things that we're doing. We've, we're also uh, launching a family advisory board. We've created resources and workshops for our families based on their results, what they told us in our surveys. So I think you know, it, it's going to look a little nuanced in every community and for every parent. And I don't want to pretend that I know what every family needs, but I believe you just ask. You ask them what they need and what they want. And, and then you make sure that they understand what the organization is here for and, and how we want to partner with them to support their students learning. And Joel, we Perfect. just ended a, ended a uh, poll. I'm, I, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. We asked what, what the top reasons are for that students experience of poverty tend to fall behind. And uh, the two highest uh, responses were, uh, one, the low income of the, of the school districts and the schools. And the second is other challenges, right? Challenges uh, being faced in the home. Uh, Joel, I, I, I didn't want to step on, your, on the point that you were making, but if you could also address that whole issue of, you know, if, if we just deal, as uh, Ola said, if, if we just deal with uh, the proximate cause, the way we interpret it, are we really addressing the the, the underlying um, issues that families are facing that that prevent uh, literacy? Uh, go ahead, Joel. I mean, it's a thorny, complex problem. Otherwise, it would have been solved by now. But I think how we frame parent involvement also um, gets us off on the wrong foot. I've never talked with a parent that doesn't want their child to read. I think parents are involved. And they're involved in ways that are right for their family. And I think if we come to work with families from a deficit orientation, saying what they aren't doing, what they can't do, how they're insufficient, we're not going to we're not going to be able to work with them in the ways that we need to. I was going to press on the earlier notion of do people need to act out of their own uh, outside of their own self interest, and you know, we're not going to be able to get people not to care for their child and their child's education at the expense of some other child. And if we frame it like that, we're not going to be able to get people in the game in the way we need people in the game. Well, you set it up for opposition, right? Right, right. I also think it's the wrong framing. I mean, I think it is voting in everyone's or, or acting in everybody's self-interest to make sure that children have the education they need to be successful. Otherwise, we're going to be paying for it down the line. They're going to be paying for it immediately, but it's not going to help us as a society advance and rise up the way we need to. And so it is in our self-interest to work together to solve this problem. And we're not going to get there with this deficit othering of the communities that we're trying to work with. And, and Heather, I, uh, we're coming to the end of our time, so we're going to give you the last word. We had a very interesting question. It, it was an interesting spin. If you take a look at the American with Disabilities Act, the, the whole premise there is that these are people who can contribute, but they're preventing from contribute by a disability, right? It's not it's not of their own making. Uh, so it's it's part of the social compact to help those those people to be able to contribute and live productive lives. And with children, children are not choosing to have difficulties um, uh, with literacy. They're not choosing. Um, the circumstances into which they're born. So is, is there a connection between um, how we should function in a society between those who uh, live in circumstances that are not of their own making? We have an obligation there to help each other. And isn't this the same with, with children? And how do we, um, we square that circle in a way that does not create opposition, but that instead we have uh, the have parents and the have not parents basically coming together and saying, these are all of our children. These are American children. Let us help to uplift them. 
together so that we have a strong country going forward. How, how do we actually do that? How do we create that connection and the understanding between the various political parties and all the nonsense that goes on in this country? Yeah, I think I really appreciate um, Joel's point about we've kind of set this up in kind of a binary either or and not a both and. You can want what is the very best for your child. You can also want and act in ways that facilitate that very best for someone else's child who does not maybe have the, the privilege, the social and cultural capital that you have. And for me, what I've noticed is the more we educate folks on the structural and systemic inequities that put us in these positions, that put certain families in the positions that they are in, and then certain young people in the positions that they are in. And when we really understand those structural problems, it takes any, you know, kind of shame, blame, guilt out of the mix. It takes finger pointing out of them and say, okay. We, we are now in this inequitable structure and system. What do we all need to do together to create greater equity and redress this? And so until we've had that education, until we can use that to reframe the narrative, that's kind of why we're in this, you know, kind of either or space. So we're thinking about as an organization, what is our ethical commitment to really educating the community on why do we and reading partners and the and children's literacy why do we exist what are the systemic and societal reasons that necessitate us being in business and then how do we all work together to put ourselves out of business someday so your point heather and and uh it would be interesting to hear whether it's endorsed around this table your point is that this that the solution is simply excellent excellent early education for everyone. Yes, as with the educating folks on why that is, why some of us have it and some of us don't, because that's really, again, the literacy lab exists because we don't have this wealth redistribution that Joel mentioned. And there are certain school districts that could use more resources and support. And that's why we come in. We're not working in private schools. We're not working in affluent, you know, school communities. We're, we're working in under-resourced, underserved communities that have been historically historically in that situation. And so once these things become generational, it becomes this kind of mammoth thing to tackle. And so it's going to take a lot of rethinking and kind of redirecting our narratives around the who and the why, and then the what do we collectively do about it? Well, thank you so much. Thank you all for helping us understand just a little bit more of this very complex uh, and thorny problem. Heather Jenkins, CEO of the Literacy Lab in Washington, D.C., Adiola Whitney, CEO of Reading Partners, and Joe Zero, CEO of Children's Literacy Initiative in Philadelphia. Thank you so much for helping us uh, navigate this. And, and uh, thank you, boards. Thank your staff. Thank your communities. Thank your students. Thank their parents. Thank your teachers for the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have care. a great day.